And welcome to episode 110 of Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres. Ah, uh, right, okay, my apologies there. There seems to have been a major mess up somewhere along the line. Um, I think I had this set for private rather than public somewhere along the line. Um, I think I've probably confused a lot of people. It looks like we have a few viewers here. Thank goodness somebody's found us at any rate. Um, Again, well, 110 episodes in and <laughs> still managing to mess, mess up everything. So my apologies. Here we are um, live on YouTube. And you can tell it's live by the fact that I am still managing to completely and utterly mess it all up. Um, if this was recorded, I would have cut all this bit out. Right. OK, so here we are live on YouTube. And today's episode is the Architectural Photography Challenge. Two weeks ago in episode 108, um, I was, you know, Peter, um, also KPK Photography, kindly sent me a load of images and a load of information about architectural photography, something that isn't really my speciality. And so uh, following on from that, we went through the images, we went through the text that he sent me, and then I set a challenge for two weeks time, which of course is now. So this week I've had about oh, a dozen or so people send me in images for the architectural photography challenge. So we're gonna take a look through these photos. Uh, so that's what's coming up. So yes, let me know you're here. Leave me a comment, say hello. Let me know that I haven't actually lost absolutely everybody by that. Um, Bit of a mess uh, trying to get started and trying to find everything. But I can see we do have comments here. May Britt from, um, says hello all from a sunny and windy Copenhagen. So glad, thank you. Um, and May Britt had in fact warned me that I, even on the Facebook group, I had it set for the wrong time. Apparently I had it set for about to go off at 11 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night or something. Um, I thought I corrected that only to find that there was still nothing happening on YouTube because it was set to private instead. Um, what else do we have? Roy here says, well, I was interesting, got here eventually. I'm glad you could make it, Roy. My problem, um, you know, my fault. So <laughs> not you. Maggie says, here we are now in Castle Douglas. And I will just say, it's a wet and miserable Castle Douglas out there today. Um, yeah, I, <sighs> weather-wise. Yes, you'll have to give me a minute or two just while I kind of calm down again. Uh, April says, hello, everyone from a hot and sunny Long Island, New York. Also had trouble. Uh, getting here. Meg says hello everyone. Binod Singh says hello everyone. Glad you could make it. Uh, Karen says oh, I got in eventually. Happy Sunday everyone. Hope all's well that ends well. Um, uh, Annette Porro says hello from sunny Brussels. I'm having some tech issues so sorry I'm late. It wasn't you, it was me. Um, now Annette, is that Anya? I have to let me know because I think there was an Anya who was also known as Annette. So please confirm that one or is it someone different? Um, Peter says hello all from a cloud, um, cloudy and cold and wet Annan. It doesn't sound like it's very different in Annan than it is from Castle Douglas. John says hello all from a damp day in Columbus, Ohio. Looking forward to this podcast. Good. Um, excellent. Uh, Karen says cloudy and quite muggy in Shipley. That's in Yorkshire. Jim says yes, also a problem. has got a private message. All OK now, though. Um, and Binot says, good evening from India. Excellent. Jim says, oh yeah, overcast in Dumfries. And um, okay, Annette says, I can't see the video, only the chat, unfortunately. I keep getting a countdown clock. Hmm. Try refreshing it. Try refreshing your, your page and hopefully you might, you might get something um, there. In fact, I will just see if I can type into the comments just in case you are only getting the, the, the comments. Um, Try refreshing if you can't see the video. Right, okay. Um, right, and Rosemary says, greetings from Washington State, where the sun is finally shining. Not sure why the hitching getting connected. Well, that's because you missed the beginning where I was apologizing about it. it's all my fault. <laughs> um, and Annette says, I'm now on the phone, but not on the laptop. All oh, right, perfect, on phone, thank you. Brilliant. And now, you might have missed what I asked earlier, is Annette. I think, Annette, is this Anya? And if it is, please let me know, because uh, I, did, I did get something set in from Anya, um, who said I've also known as Annette. So I'm wondering if it's the same one. So, <sighs> goodness me. Right, okay. <laughs> 
let's let's try and make a proper start on this now. Um, so the architectural, it is on you. Brilliant. OK. Um, so, yeah, the architectural photography is this is this is a whole area that I I've never done a podcast about because it's not really my speciality. I don't know much about it. And so a couple of weeks ago in episode 108, if you've not seen it, you can go back and watch it after this. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kim Ayers, find the playlist Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers and go to episode 108. And you'll find the episode is all about, um, it's really an introduction to architectural photography with all the help from Peter, KPK Photography, um, who sent me images and it, and uh, ways of looking and things to kind of look out for. And it was really interesting. And on the back of that, we set up this podcast, this challenge now, what I said I would do is I said I would do the challenge too. Um, and so it was, it's kind of a bit, oh, I must admit, it was really quite strange for me. I went, I cut down Castle Douglas High Street, I went down one day and um, took a bunch of photos. And that's re I realised I started looking at the buildings in a very different way, looking for shape, looking for interesting little corners and and carvings and, and stuff like that and uh and it did really change the way i looked at the high street and anyway i got back and i looked at all the photos on the on the um on the computer and i found one or two fairly interesting bits but i wasn't entirely sure i had much so a couple of days later i went back out and this time i put the zoom lens on the camera and was really trying to pick out details and i found that really interesting too um so, yeah, I found a couple of different, you know, things going on. But I thought, well, OK, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and show 20 different photos that I took. This is the challenge. And generally speaking, I say to everybody, you know, send in one image each. But what I do want to show you, what I did discover um, from my own personal journey on the architectural photography was let's. Um, OK, let me just show you. In fact, in the end, the photo that I'm deciding to show is the one I used on the Facebook page, but I want to show you something else about it because pretty much directly opposite out my window is the library in Castle Douglas. And this is what the whole building looks like. So very Scottish looking um, building, you know, the red sandstone, nice little kind of pepper pot turret or not pepper pot, kind of little round turret thing um, in the foreground. And uh, it's, it's quite a fun build. We've also got a little palm tree out there uh, and there's a monkey puzzle tree, which has grown considerably in the 17 years that we were here, that we've been here. And also attached to the library, um, there's a little extra bit of building over here that was added on afterwards, which is uh, an art gallery. You can hire, rent that space to do your own little exhibitions. Or at least we have up until two years ago. <laughs> it's been closed since COVID, um, but I don't know whether they might be opening it again soon. So the point is, is that there's this building and this building, this is a photo of essentially the whole building or an angle of the building with a bit of the turret um, obscured by a part of the monkey puzzle tree. But kind of, apart from the monkey puzzle tree branch, this tends to be the iconic angle you take a photo of this building from. Now, in terms of architectural photography, in a way it is because it's a photo of a building. But the thing is, is what we were learning from Peter two weeks ago was the idea of really picking out details. And there's something quite interesting when you try and cap capture a part of the building, maybe, without any sky. So you're kind of zeroing in and kind of looking for shape and line. And so what I did was... Um, out of my bedroom window, in fact, I looked across and I took this photo. What I decided, so you can see here that what I've done is I've decided to not include any of the sky. We've got the, the turret here with the window, but then we've got the way the roof kind of comes in and the little drain here. The light was coming in and reflecting. And this is a wet day. It is raining. Um, if I zoom in here. On the guttering, you can just about see where it's darker. You can just about see the streaks of rain that are coming down. So this was taken on a day not similar to the one that I've got with now. You'll also notice if I zoom in, it starts to get a bit noisy. The ISO was higher because the light was lower. But on a different day, exactly the same angle, sunny day. And in this, this is quite late in the afternoon. 
Um, if we go back to this one, this is slightly earlier in the afternoon, you can see the sun hasn't come round as far as this part of the building. The sun's very much on the right side, and you see the shadow of the tower just here. A little bit later in the afternoon, now the sun has come round, this is the monkey puzzle tree reflecting on it, the, the shadow of the tower has now moved around onto this roof and it's got a very different mood and feel to it. So from that to that, and this is really the point I wanted to the, the point I wanted to make was it's always worth even you know if you find a nice little shape a nice little space a nice little detail go back under different weather conditions go back under different times of day and then finally the the one that I was using for um, uh, for the Facebook thing was this one uh, which I've edited a little bit more as well but this one was taken just after sunset so the sun had moved right round there was a last warm glow in the sky particularly hitting this this corner of the tower um, and the red sandstone had become kind of a deeper red. Now, when I took the photo, because the camera, the auto white balance was sort of going for the reddishness, it kind of made the, a slight blue, more of a bluish tint onto the, um, the roof tiles. So I enhanced that in the, in, the, in the editing software just to try and kind of create that more kind of color balance thing. So with each of these photos, this one, this one, and this one, they're all essentially the same photo, but they are massively different depending on the time of day, the lighting um, and the weather conditions. So that's really what I wanted to, so that, that was my entry and that's kind of what I wanted to show you there. Oh, nuts. Um, oh, okay. Um, history. <laughs> Restore window. Right, okay. My apologies about that. While closing windows, I managed to close the, the stream as well. Hopefully, you're back again. Hopefully, I haven't lost you all. <laughs> I can't believe the technical problems. And this is not just technical problems. This is entirely me problems. This is me just messing things up. Um, something wrong. Okay. I've got comments, right? Um, okay, so Annette is on you. Great. Okay, so Facebook has a very Irish name. Uh, April says pretty Irish name. So nice little bit of uh, bits going back and forth there. Um, okay, Meg says, Dad, try and relax just now. You'll do well. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. Uh, Pat says, I've spent ages trying to find the page. Looking at Woody, I may be here now. Bit why? Okay. Yeah. Uh, apologies once again, Pat. Um, if at the end of this, you go back and look at the beginning, you'll find all my apologies for why I seem to be messing all this up. Um, okay. April says, very pretty. Interesting differences in time. Maggie says, we didn't lose you at all. All right. So you might have heard me swearing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pat says, so relieved it wasn't me. No, it wasn't you, Pat. It was me entirely. Um, okay, Peter says, good example of changing light on a photo. Good. So let's make a start then with everybody else. So we've had, um, I've had, a, uh, like I say, I've had about a dozen or so people send in images. Um, so let me just try and set this up because, yeah, I mean, I... What can I say? So what we're going to do then is I'm going to turn to that. We're going to start off with um, Ruth. OK, so now Ruth, uh, Ruth was, in fact, um, I think for until she retired, was actually the director of the Royal Institute for British Architecture. And she joined us for um, the well, she, she was watching in on the, the podcast a couple of weeks ago, sent, sent some, um, some ideas about the fact that um, the Royal Institute for British Architecture webs, uh, also has a part of their website, the sort of picture side of it, where they're constantly looking for new architectural photos as well. And I think I left links. You can find them in, in the last one. You go back to episode 108 and possibly, yeah, episode 108, and you'll find in the, in the description part links to other sites and things to go and investigate. However, she sent in some photos and let's put up the, the photo she sent. So she sent in this one and said, uh, this is the foundation Louis Vuitton, um, Paris, France, architect, uh, Jerry Partners, LLP, 2014. Now, 
Essentially, what happened is she took two photos. There's this one, and then a year later, she took this one. Exactly the same building, more or less exactly the same angle. Um, she says the one with the coloured filters was taken in 2016 um, and was installed by French artist Daniel Burren. Probably pronounced something different, but I'll go with that one. Um, so the one, one with the clear glass, this one was taken in 2015, shortly after Frank Gehry's building opened. I wanted to show what a difference a year makes to a building. Um, uh, so really, I, I thought this is quite an interesting, you know, so she's she's taken this angle, getting this particular part of the shape of the building. So again, it's all about line and curve, line and form, really. Um, this one then, different day, but yeah, the coloured bits have been added. I thought it was a really interesting building um, and really interesting to kind of have the comparison. Um, Ruth also says she just took this on a, a Sony a uh, small camera, um, which is the one she has, and it has everything set on all automatic, otherwise she tends to get left behind um, when they're on tours. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I can kind of, I can, I can kind of appreciate that. So thank you, Ruth, for sending that one in. Um, so that's the, that, that was the, the kind of the, the first image I wanted to, to show with that one. So now let's see, now close that one. Try not to close the whole bit here. Um, oh, Anya says you're doing brilliant, Kim. Tech is tricky. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate the comforting thoughts. Um, uh, April says, "Wow, pretty coloured filters." Yep. Cool. Okay. So next up, then next up, let's move. So I'm not going to do huge amounts. I'm really critique on this. There are one or two photos which I'm going to talk a little bit of people that when they've submitted have asked specifically for feedback. But basically, the main point of today's podcast is to look at the photos we've been sent and um, and be a little bit inspired. See, you know, a lot of us here are kind of slightly new to architectural photography. Um, so I think it's really interesting to see what other people have been up to as well, how they've interpreted um, the, the, the contest idea, or not contest, the challenge idea rather. So next up then, uh, we have Jim. And Jim went out to um, Rosefield Mills. Anybody who remembers way back about a year and a half ago, possibly two years ago, I talked about a shoot I did at Rosefield Mills um, using a Peaky Blinders 1920s gangster theme anyway this is the outside or one of the corners of the outside of the building and Jim said this is my chat su um, submission for the architectural photo challenge Rosefield Mills in Dumfries the club had a talk by Nigel Forster an architectural photography back a photographer back in February and was influenced by his method of shooting towards the sky with the building lines from the bottom corner of the image so um, uh, and the sorry, and the lines not being vertical. So what you can see here is that there's a diagonal coming up here, but he's very much taken this diagonal line down into the bottom right corner. So rather than tilting it straight up and having a, a, a complete vertical, he's gone for the diagonal, and that diagonal draws us that bit more up into the um, into the picture. And as I've talked before about the idea with diagonals, diagonals can add a certain level of energy and movement to a building. And, and I think also because you kind of get that kind of tilted feel to perspective shoot, it's, it's almost slightly vertigo inducing, if you know what I mean. So um, anyway, here we can see, you know, a nice the, the red brick work, the, the green ivy and the blue sky. So it's quite a powerful, bright, um, color palette to this one as well. Uh, so Jim goes on, I was walking along the riverside path in Dumfries and chanced upon this shot. So this is the one. I did try some other shots of the building, but this is the one I like best. So excellent, nice one there. Actually, I should, of course, smug points. Let's hand out the smug points. Pretty much smug points to anybody who's actually sent anything in. And certainly smug points for anybody who's stuck around it or <laughs> and managed to find this podcast after all my complete mess up with the start of it. Um, Right. OK, so, yeah, smug points to you there, Jim. Uh, thank you for sending that one in. Um, OK, oh, VG's managed uh, to make it. it, says good evening. Uh, glad you could make it, VG. Um, and April says, I like that concept that you were taught, Jim. And Maggie says she also really likes the, the, the shape of this. And Binod says good evening. Hello. And hello again, Binod. I think I said hello to you earlier, but maybe it got missed with all the confusion. 
Right. Okay. So next one I want to send, uh, show you is John. Now, John, does, he's been connected to the Facebook group for the full two years, um, though this is the first time he sent anything in. But he said, I took this photo several years ago and it still hangs in my dining room. And I realized when he said that, I suddenly realized, yes, he's, he's, it's hanging in the dining room with a sheet of glass on the front of it, because we can, in fact, see his phone, a uh, reflection of his hand holding his phone, taking it. <laughs> so, John, if you ever happen to come back and watch this, rule number one, watch out for reflections when you're photographing anything which has a glass front on it. Anyway. If we can kind of slightly filter out the hand and phone, which is difficult once you've seen it, uh, they are rather beautiful shapes. I do like the fact that we've got, um, you know, these sort of greens and yellows and reds, and it's very geometrical. You know, it's kind of a lot of good architectural photos tend to kind of focus in on the geometry. So he says, I took this several years ago. Um, I, I thought it, I did a good job of capturing the angles from the top of Tybee Island Lighthouse in Georgia. Um, so yeah, so that's actually, for, so he's up on the top of the lighthouse just looking straight down. So now he says that, I can notice that this is probably a, a red roof. Looks like there's a little window sitting in here, but he's managed very much, it's, it is a case of the, capturing those architectural lines. The only thing I would have said really, John, is maybe is you've got this bit up in the top left corner, which I'm not really sure is adding anything to it. And maybe if you just kind of, tilted this a little bit maybe straightened these like one of these lines here and then that vertical would have held all the other diagonals in place would have just kind of so just essentially tilt it slightly and crop that bit out and i think you end up with the perfect photo but thanks very much for sending that one in john um uh April says, nice abstract. Oh, yeah, and then goes, whoa, lighthouse. <laughs> Colourful and lovely, says VG. Um, and uh, Maggie says, the ambiguity of it is pleasing. Uh, May Britt also likes the lines and the colours, John. So, good response to you there, John. Um, okay, next up, we're going to go for Roy. And Roy, uh, yeah, Roy gets an extra smug point here for being the first person to put, put, put an image in for this challenge. And uh, Roy says, I will kick things off with this, with this image for the architectural challenge. Huddersfield has a wide spectrum of architectural styles, including the iconic George Hotel, birthplace of the Rugby League in 1895, which stands next to the 1847 railway station, which is well known in architectural styles for its neoclassical style facade. Both these buildings are in stark contrast to the very modern architecture found in many of the university buildings. If, so having told us about all these amazing different buildings, he then goes on. Eventually, I went for the John Smith Stadium, home to both Huddersfield Town Football Club and the Huddersfield Giants rugby league team. This corner detail shows parts of the support system for two of the stands and one of the floodlight units. I felt that the mono conversion was appropriate for this graphic image. So, yeah, this is a great idea then of, um, again, moving in on the detail. It's gone for the geometric and uh, almost symmetrical, not fully symmetrical in the way, you know, as we've talked before, that slight asymmetrical symmetry. Again, though, I do have to say, John, it kind of feels this line here feels like the it's just very slight. You need to tilt it left to one degree, I would say. Mind you. Yeah. Would that throw that one out? I think that could stand being tilted left one degree. That might then just give you. That slight because because everything is so symmetrical with this, it just feels like you just need to nudge it to make it properly done. Otherwise, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my OCD. Um, however, I think in black and white conversion that allows it to be, when you convert it to black and white, we're taking a, we're removing distraction of color. I mean, I would imagine there's probably quite a bit of you know we can see texture here. But if you added color into that, which might include rust or peeling paint or whatever, it might end up kind of distracting from um, Roy's narrative, which is about the shape. So nice one there, I think. And I think the idea of converting it to black and white was a good idea. So thanks for sending that one in, Roy. I have a smug point. Um, and uh, oh, Rosie's here, says, hi, everyone. Had a change of plan this afternoon, so free and on my own. Well, welcome, Rosie. Glad you could make it. And in case you hadn't picked up, this is the architectural challenge show uh, from two weeks ago. Uh, we set up the architectural challenge and you can go back and watch episode 108 if you have time and you have the interest. Um, okay, um, 
Pat says, so punchy and vibrant, Roy. Uh, Fiji says, welcome, Rosie. April says, I like this in black and white. And Jim says, a nice geometry, Roy. Cool, okay. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to Vandana. And Vandana sent in this one, a cathedral in Bath. Um, says, love the long columns and the beautiful carvings. Well, yeah, um, cathedrals can be incredible places and certainly you know, get, get down into Bath. And it really is something quite, I mean, some of the, the architecture in this is just absolutely astounding. The, the skill that went into building these things is, is quite astonishing. Um, and this, I mean, taken with the phone, but I, and I think in this sense, in this, this is one of those where actually having it in portrait mode works well so that you get everything from the window up through to the incredible ceiling. Again, there's a slight kind of, as we come down here, in terms of your angles, it would have been nice to have a slightly more horizontal. I think it's in essence what you needed to do was just sort of step about a meter or so to your right. And then when you took the, it's, what you need to do is something, if you are doing something like this and you're trying to get that, that geometry there, is you've got to line yourself up with the middle you know, there's seven panels, seven columns of windows here. You line yourself up with the middle one. Um, stand so that you are facing it absolutely directly. And then when, you, when you've got your phone, everything should sort of line up properly rather than part of it lining up and part of it maybe feeling slightly tilted. That aside, uh, I think it was, it's, it's a great... Uh, if you're inside these kind of big churches and cathedrals and what have you, looking up is always a good thing to do. Uh, and you very often find some amazing architectural details in it. So, nicely spotted there, Vandana. Smug points to you for that one. Um, uh, oh, Pat says, makes me feel closer to heaven. That chance. <laughs> uh, Bino says, after a long time watching live video again. Um, oh, welcome back then. Uh, Jim says, nice shot. Uh, Karen says fab ceiling and uh, VG noticed the slight, slight tilt as well. Yeah, April says it's very pretty. So let's move on. Now we have uh, John, John from, um, oh, John from Ohio um, has sent in um, this next, oh, okay, let's, let's show you and then I'll tell you what he's written. So this, this building from John and uh, says, this is Worthington Inn circa 1831. Now, 1831 has to be said in um, in the US is like a really, really old, old building. Um, 1831 in the UK, not so much. There's plenty of people living. In fact, I think even the house we live in is probably 18, 1850s or 1890s or something like that. A uh, little bit more common. But I remember that when I, I spent a bit of time in Canada is there isn't such a kind of deep time. I mean, when you talk... It's, talk to the likes of Fiji or Binod, or, you know, in India, they then have temples which are thousands of years old. Um, but this one, 1831, um, says, Worthington is a town inside Columbus, Ohio, near where I live. Our local camera club was on a photography scavenger hunt uh, the evening I took this. I had to stand across the road to get it all in. I like the porch and woodwork on the front of the building. So there's a really interesting point here, I think, John, which is... You've got the whole building, um, but actually what you said you really like is uh, the porch and the, and the, um, the woodwork. The, what is it? So the porch and the woodwork on the, on the front of the building. So it's more about this. That, that's the bit that's really catching your eye rather than necessarily the whole building. And if we go back to uh, my photos of the library right back at the beginning of this podcast, I think the... It's the same kind of thing. You can take a photo of the whole building and that's maybe OK. But I think when you're thinking architectural photography, don't think whole building. Think part of building. Try and abstract part of that building and create something interesting out of that. And so as such, why do you, you know, you've gone and stood further back to try and get the whole building in. I would have said get closer. You know, if the bit that's really grabbing your attention is the woodwork, the porch, there's something about the way you like the way the wood is, the way it's shaped or the colour combinations, then get in and kind of isolate that, find an interesting way of framing it within the camera. And I think then you might find, uh, I think that kind of opens up 
a little bit more. Don't think whole building, think part of building. Um, and you might, I, and so if you do find yourself back there, try that, John. Try, you know, and then show us the results. Let us know how you get on. Um, that would be really interesting to see. So thanks for sending that one in. Um, uh, what have we got? Oh, April says, I really like the shape of this building. And uh, Rosemary says, fun point about historical dates. Here on the West Coast, USA, anything prior to 900 is considered ancient. <laughs> yes, I can, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, right. OK, next up then, we've got Karen. Now, Karen um, sent in this one and said... Uh, a bit, uh, do, 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 do. She sent it in quite late, but I'd only watched the podcast that morning. But it said, anyway, I had fun having a go. This, these are from the back of a building. Uh, so this is a building that seems quite smooth and pristine. And I quite like the fact there's tiny imperfection in the white cladding is slightly coming away. So that's down in that corner there, I think. Um, also like the elements that are quite, um, quite clean lines and not symmetrical. I also like the t textures. As a shot, uh, shot, as the sky was grey. It always seemed to go well with the shot. Uh, so, um, so the, Karen's sort of taken and isolated again the kind of geometric shapes, uh, which I think are really quite interesting. Now, the only problem is this: I'm not sure exactly what you've done with the uh, with the editing here because. There's something not quite, it looks like you kind of sort of tried to darken some bits and lighten other bits. And what we find is there's a sort of fluffiness as such. You know, there's a, there's a, you've got it fairly evenly dark and then there's a white patch here. This bit here looks like it's sort of been lightened, but not all the way around. Um, and so, and again, edging up here. So if you've been, it's like you've kind of done sort of selective darkening but it hasn't really matched up to the edges. Similarly, we notice around the door here. Um, so I think it's one of those things you've got to be slightly careful of with the editing. Now you didn't send me the original, so I can't, I'm not totally sure um, what the original looked like, but I think what you can do sometimes with these, I mean, I know we didn't really talk too much about the editing process when we were looking at Peter's pictures, but I know sometimes what he does do is if he's wanting to emphasize, create more of an abstract image out of something that's existing, then what he will sometimes do is, is saying, or what you can do, I mean, actually, I, I shouldn't say that he does this because I don't know for certain, but I would guess um, that what he do, would do is you can create, um, okay, let, supposing then, if, to get round this fact that I, if you just wanted to darken the sky or lighten the sky or just have an ele element to it, supposing I just select that area of sky. Now what I'll do, I'll just do this on a separate layer. Um, and then I can choose a colour. Maybe I want that, or maybe supposing I wanted to have it not completely white, but a pale grey. Having selected that, I can now just paint that in completely and we don't have any kind of funny edging. Likewise, if I wanted, if I go back here, I could say select this area, which again has got some, you know, just make sure I've got, uh, come back in here, select that bit. Um, so this bit of wall, and again, maybe we want to select that slightly darker. And if I then go back on here and paint that smooth in like that, deselect. So the difference then between that and that is apart from the fact that the sky is light and so it's emphasizing it a bit more but primarily what's happened is we've managed to get rid of these um these edging problems here where it's all kind of one color but they're not quite around the edge and that's very much i recognize as a software editing problem depending on how you were editing it and the kind of software you were using might have caused more of a problem with it so actually sectioning off and then just editing that section is sometimes a way around that. And then that helps you to kind of emphasize these geometrical shapes um, without necessarily having that kind of fluffy edged problem. Well, I think it's an interesting shape. Uh, I think it was well worth spotting there. So um, hope that helps. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, 
Uh, Jim says sometimes less is more. Binod says love the green plants. Green plants. Okay, must be talking about the previous photo because <laughs> there weren't any green plants in Karen's one there. Um, April says I like the lines and light on the left part of the building. VG says old sky. I thought it was wall too. Good structure. Actually, maybe it was wall. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm mistaking it for sky. Could have been a bigger building. Uh, Anya says uh, that's something I want to learn how to do in editing. I'm using GIMP. I have the same edging problems. Um, Binod says, Kim, please suggest a good camera. Ah. Okay, Binod, the, there's, there's a massive problem in suggesting a good camera because I don't know how you would be using the camera. And basically, there's an entire podcast you could do on that. A camera comes down to your select brief. Oh, it's worth just doing a quick tangent for anybody else. Please bear with me, but I think it's worth answering this. The camera comes down to a number of things. One is how you're going to use it. Two is the budget that you've got. Both these things can have a powerful impact on the kind of camera you need. Now, if you are needing a camera professionally because you are going to be out there every day or every week, especially at the weekends, hard using the camera, you need to have a more expensive professional DSLR or mirrorless camera in order to be able to take the bangs, take the knocks and take the use. If you are kind of um, just starting out, so you don't need a really big fancy camera. Very often, I mean, modern phones do incredible things. If you're wanting something a bit beyond a phone, a bridge camera is quite often a good idea. A bridge camera is like a bit between a point and shoot and a DSLR. It tends to have the one lens, but that one lens goes from everything from macro through to super zoom. So very often I recommend people, it's, if they're getting their first camera beyond their phone, I would say look out for a decent bridge camera. And at that point, then it's down to your budget. You look at your budget, you say, how much am I prepared to spend? And what can I get for that money? And maybe you'll find something within your budget, or maybe you'll find you know, that you need to up your budget a bit or decide how you're gonna spread payments or something like that. But really, your first point is, how are you gonna be using the camera? How are you gonna be using the pictures? Because if the pictures are only ever gonna appear on the web and you're not planning on printing them, you don't need such a big fancy camera and then what your budget is. So those are your kind of starting questions. Depending on how you answer those questions and then a whole bunch of subset questions would influence then which camera you would go for. Um, but straight off the top, I'm afraid I can't really turn around and say, this is the camera you want because it may be completely unsuitable for your needs. But I hope that gives you a starting point, Binod. Um, Karen says, uh, thanks for the tips and tricks, appreciated, excellent. Right, okay, let's, uh, oh, yeah, let's just have a quick, pause here and uh, just to remind you that um, if you uh, if you find these podcasts useful entertaining beneficial and you would like to support them in some way then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is a, one of the ways you can do it uh, what I will also say let's do a quick a, a quick bit here where the question of the week now actually last week I completely forgot about the question of the week I will just quickly run through because I thought it was kind of fun. I said, what are you currently or most recently binge watching? So anybody who's sort of there, they've got their Netflix, Amazon, Disney Plus, all the rest of it, wondering what to binge watch. Richard said The Alienist uh, was, was one that he'd been enjoying. Sarah said Heartland. Russ and Michelle were both catching up with Peaky Blinders. Daphne said Ozark. VG said Anne with an E. Nadia said uh, My YouTube Videos, uh, for which I gave her extra, extra smug points for that. <laughs> <laughs> you can always binge watch. We have 109 previous videos to this one. You can go and binge watch them. Um, Stacey said uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Jackie said Succession. So there's a bunch of recommendations for you if you're looking for something to binge watch. This week I asked people what, the, what weather conditions do you struggle the most with to get an interesting photo? And VG said she struggles most with fog and misty conditions. Now, which is rather handy because next week we're going to be talking about photographing in the fog and mist. So that was following on from uh, last week, I think, or the week before when Rosemary put in a photo for critique. Um, talking about struggling with fog, I thought maybe now's the time to sort of give a few tips and tricks on photographing in foggy and misty conditions. Roy said he struggles with overcast, dull days with no direction or light. Now, I can understand that if that, you know, but in a way, Roy, 
these kind of days, I think, benefit you one of the most because you love black and white. When you are, when there's a really strong light, very often that's, you know, strong sunlight, strong directional light. You want to play with shadows, but also really enriches colour. So if you're doing colour, bright sunlight can have quite a lot of fun with that. However, if you're not, if, if things are a kind of a dull, overcast, nothing in particular, then when you go to black and white, it's, you can play much more with the texture because a strong sunlight will make the shadows really dark and the highlights really bright. So the camera will struggle to have a good range between the light and dark. However, on a dull overcast day, you end up getting the full range of all the greys in between. But the colour doesn't tend to be as rich. So actually, dull days tend to suit black and white much more. So get out and about and look for your shapes and your textures. And, and, and uh, so I would say, yeah, black and white is really the way to go on dull days. Jackie said she actually struggles with very bright sunlight. Um, and which is kind of the opposite problem in which case I would say make the most of colours make the most of directional shadows um, also maybe if you if it's too strong during the middle of the day take your photos into either earlier in the morning or later in the afternoon and really then play with the longer shadows and the slightly softer light that you get around towards the golden hour and Jim says he struggles with hazy days, struggling to get good definition, especially in landscapes. Um, now, haze, a bit like mist, and I will talk in more direction about the mist and fog photos because there's a little bit in common here. If you've got a hazy day, then yes, every, all the definition disappears out in the distance. So what you've got to do is you've got to anchor it with something in the foreground because something in the foreground, the haze hasn't had a chance to... Um, diminish the detail so you can have something in the if you can create something strong in the foreground and allow the hazy landscape to become uh, a much more kind of atmospheric background I think that's your starting point with that anyway these are just kind of quick tips we'll probably investigate some of these more in detail at a later point okay what have we got a couple more comments here John says just tuned in and saw your comments thanks for talking about my photo excellent John um glad you glad you made it along for that Rosemary says my toughest weather is the deep overcast where the light is so low we get lots of days like that a light overcast is fine but the deep ouch well, in that case, kind of like I said to John, but I think black, black and white, sorry, to Roy, to black and white is quite a good way of going. And maybe also use a tripod, uh, because when you've got that really deep, dark overcast, you're going to be struggling for light and handheld. You'll end up going for a very high ISO as you're con combating the essentially low light conditions. So get a tripod and then try and set up with that and allow yourself longer exposures. And then you'll find that there's a lot more kind of detail to come out with that. But then, as I say, maybe try black and white as well. Onya says it's really interesting about black and white working on dull days. Very encouraging for me as I live in Brussels where most of the year is overcast. Oh, well, that's useful then. Um, oh, and John says enjoying the podcast. Excellent. And April says thank you for the tips. Superb. Right. OK, let's carry on then. Let's return now to... Um, our selection of images sent in by uh, regular viewers. So this one from Nadia then. Uh, so Nadia sent in this one. Uh, Nadia's up in Fife and said, where if I can find it. I was out with a photography friend when we stumbled across this view of the underside of the Queensferry Crossing. So the Queensferry Crossing is what the big road bridge that goes across the um, the fourth or the Firth of Fourth. Um, which essentially Edinburgh over to Fife. So you've got this, and I think this is the road bridge, so you've got, and but what she's managed to do is get, essentially get under the bridge. And this is another great, uh, if you do it into architectural photography, under bridges can quite often be really interesting ones. And with this, again, you're going for geomet geometry and shape. And again, converting it to black and white means we're not getting distracted by the colour of the water, the colour of the sky, the colour of the... The, the landscape in the background. No doubt, if this was a colour photo, it would still look interesting. Uh, but at that point, the colour of the water and the sky and um, the, the background would be kind of being, a, would end up being a strong part of the photo. But by removing the colour, just like with um, Roy's photo earlier, of that corner part of the stadium, um, it allows us to concentrate and focus much more on line and form. 
So again, it doesn't matter, you know, it, uh, this may well have been a dull day. It doesn't look, uh, or maybe there's a bit of shadow there. Maybe it is a brighter day, difficult to tell in black and white. But again, for those of you who are worrying about photographing on a dull day, this is where black and white comes into its own. So lovely shapes, smoke points to you there, uh, Nadia. And uh, thank you very much for sending that one in. Rosemary says, what fun, unique perspective of the bridge. April says, cool, abstract. Jim says, I like the symmetry under the bridge. Fiji says, interesting shot. May Britt also says, very interesting view under the bridge. I like the lines. Yeah, bridges are, can be fun if you can get, if you can find a way underneath them. Not all, you don't always get access, but every now and again, you might get lucky. Certainly it's worth looking out for. Right, okay. So next up then, we're going to look at Fiji. Now, Fiji sent in... Um, uh, she sent in a photo, changed her mind, sent in another photo, changed her mind, sent in another photo. That's okay, though. And actually, the third time she sent something in was kind of on my recommendation because she was telling me about... Um, <clears throat> she'd been out sort of struggling to sort of find bits and pieces and had been kind of raiding the archives. Um, but then she was talking about the fact that she'd been out in the, the building where the office where she works is in is this big modern building and it's got this huge atrium and there's um, lots of kind of staircases and beautiful lines in it. And so she whipped out her phone and started taking photos and then suddenly realized she had something much more interesting to show. So um, she found a stairwell and then did a straightforward looking straight up it. And these these kind of stairwells, these are great. These are, you know, I mean, again, for all of you who are sort of who do the uh, online competitions and contests like photo crowd and guru shots and uh, view bug and what have you you know and but likewise some of the photos we saw from peter two weeks ago this this kind of spiral thing is is always a lot of fun um the lines lead us up to the the the, the, the dough covered the, the the glass dome at the top now, this one was, I think, probably just quickly taken on the phone. Um, it's a little bit dull. Uh, I mean, and I think in, uh, let's sort of close, sorry, let's just close this one from Karen. And I think straightforwardly, if I take the levels here and move that to the left, we kind of brighten it up a little bit and it looks a little bit more interesting. However, there are, a, just to quickly mention, there are a couple of other things you could do here. Um, it's, essentially, there's two ways you can go, I, I would say, with something like this, is, Part of the under part of the stairs isn't really showing is we're kind of struggling a little bit to look. So what you can do is if you take the shadows and pull the shadows up, we'll brighten that up a bit and then pull the shadows right up. And now you can see the detail starts to come out. Sorry, uh, pull back out. You can see the detail starts to come out on the underside of the stairs and you get a lot more texture into it. So that's one way that you can go. Another way you can go with this is to essentially remove the texture um, and just concentrate as much as you can on the lines themselves. So at that point, what we would do is take the shadows down, maybe even take the blacks down, something like that, boost the highlights, boost the whites. And then maybe if you wanted, if we, um, we do the same trick that some of the others have been doing, which is we actually desaturate put it just into black and white and now because we're not actually seeing the undersides of the stairs um take those back down like that um this then becomes all about it we go for hard contrast black and white and then it's all about the lines and the spirals and um you know so the shape is everything and it's not actually to do, you know we we are going ab even more emphasizing the abstract so this one emphasizes like the texture within it. This one emphasizes the line. So you can kind of see how you can take something like this and really play with it in the editing to have a little bit more fun. But lovely shot and yeah, now, now you know you've got the building, get out there, go in with your, your, your camera, you know, your, your DSLR or uh, the mirrorless that uh, your friend lent you um, and play around and see if you can get some really interesting shapes. I think they're just, a building like that is crying out for it because the architect, the architect of a building like that has designed these things, especially things like stairwells, um, for people to look up and go, wow. So they're kind of trying to make your job as a photographer as easy as possible. So smug points there, VG. Hope you, um, I hope you found some of those ideas useful. 
Okay, um, comments then. Uh, Matt uh, Maybrit says, a uh, very uh, beautiful shot, VG. April says, uh, pretty spiral. Uh, love the shot, beautiful with the shadows. Um, Pat says, fascinating, I can see the wonderful eye. It does have that very eye-like look to it, doesn't it? Jim says, very good, VG. Chance photos are sometimes the best. And VG says, I will reshoot them again with a, with a, with a, with a camera. Uh, Rosemary says, I like the contrast, which emphasizes the line and shape. Nadia says it was a semi-bright day. Oh, this is, Nadia's the one who did the under the bridge one. It says it was a semi-bright day, but the colour of the water and background was washed out, which is why I converted it to black and white. Yep, excellent. Good way of doing it. Meg says with the spiral photo, it makes you very dizzy when you're looking at the photo. <laughs> yeah, there is that kind of, again, it's that kind of vertigo feeling that you of, of you know, like you're, uh, when you look up, sometimes it's like when you look down a long distance, you kind of, it makes you a little bit dizzy um, from the sort of the sheer height of it. Right, okay, let's move on. Now, next one um, comes from uh, Anya. Now, this is interesting because she was also looking up. Now, inside an old uh, an old ruin. So, uh, Anya says, this is an image of a Villiers Abbey ruin in Belgium. Uh, if you've got time to comment on Sunday, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to, um, yeah. This is this is another kind of look up, a bit like the looking up at the, up the stairwell, but it's quite different. And so we've got a ruined abbey, old building, unlike um, Van Danna's, where you're looking up at the abbey in the cathedral and you can see all the, the incredible domed roof. This one, the roof is completely gone. Now, what I would say with this on here, first of all, yeah, I can, I, it's great. You're standing there, you look up, you're looking for shape. We've got this great sort of rectangle. Where I think uh, we, it becomes slightly problematic is the fact that, that we've got the, the outer slide lines are drawing our eye up to a very large chunk of blue, which is more or less empty. So it doesn't really become about the building. Our eyes go past the building and to look at the sky. But the sky itself, other than a wispy bit of cloud, isn't really that interesting. The interesting bit with a building like this is, in fact, things like... Um, is the stone and the arches and the carving and the, the, the sheer stonework that went into it. That's what makes it kind of, and the, and the arch here, these are all great, but from this angle, they're all creating leading lines up to nothing. And so that's drawing our eye away from what's interesting. So there's a couple of different things you can do with this. Um, now, one of the things, so I'll just duplicate that layer for a moment. Again, be, and a lot of these details here are lost in the shadow. So let me just go to um, camera or filter and a bit like I did with the first version of VG's one, bring up the shadows. So if I grab the shadows tool and bring this up here, um, a little bit more contrast, maybe a little bit of clarity, something like that. So very quick edit here. And now what we can see is we can see far more detail in the... Um, the stone, the stonework. Um, and so now, our, because we can see the, our eyes do get start to get drawn back to the stone, which is, which is what I really tend to feel this is kind of about. However, it is still too dominant. So in a way, I think what you kind of need to do is zoom out. And by zooming out, that might mean lying on the floor. It might mean using a wide angle lens. But you essentially, if you want to have some, if you want to have this patch of blue, I think the patch of blue just doesn't, you don't, we've got to find a way of not allowing it to dominate so much. It's currently taking up probably, you know, 40 to 50% of the pixels here. Now, if you were to sort of zoom out, now I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to use content aware, which isn't going to do a proper thing, a, a proper rebuilding of it. But I want to give you a little idea here that if we just pull out a little bit like this, and then I do the content aware. Now, like I say, it's, it's obviously it's not replicating it perfectly, but what you can see though, is it makes more of things like the arch. I and mean, if we take, imagine that that stonework is a bit more decent, this becomes slightly smaller and so doesn't dominate quite as much. But even at this size, it is still pretty dominant. So if we go back to this again and make it even bigger. And so let's just zoom out a bit. How big do I? I'm not totally sure. We'd have to kind of play around and guess a little bit. But if we do something like this 
and again so the content aware is going to fill in um, the space now assuming that we do have light coming through and falling onto some of the, the the texture we would end up with a lot more in the way of the textured stonework and then the whilst this is still going to draw our eye to an extent it's not going to draw our eye as much and we're going to get much more of a sense of the inside of the building and the wonderful textures and shapes and lines and forms of the inside of the abbey so i hope that kind of makes sense on you um that the um that really you've got to be very careful when you've got the line your your kind of leading lines are drawing you to an empty space because the eye follows the lines and then but nothing's delivering into it you'll see sometimes you'll see these film uh, these photos where people are looking up through something similar and then there's a, an airplane flying through the space very rarely is it ever really there they quite often photoshop them in to be honest um, but that being a or if you've got a bird of prey or something flying over the top then what's happening is the whole photo is leading your eye towards that but i do suspect that the original purpose of this photo was to um was to kind of capture that sense of the abbey in which case i think you need to be like i say either lying down or you know using a particularly wide angle lens but i hope that um i hope that gives you uh a few ideas all right okay where are we um donk uh oh Fiji says thank you everyone and uh also says to Meg that she's afraid of heights <laughs> um April says beautiful with the shadows and blue sky uh Karen says I love the extra detail presumably that's when I brought it out of the, the using the shadow uh using using camera raw rather in the editing April says uh, I wish content aware was better made well content aware can be really good if you're just kind of nudging things out a a centimeter or two where it falls apart is if you're trying to triple or quadruple the size of a picture because it's not going to know how to fill in that um uh, pat says real improvement and Anya says thanks Kim, very useful ideas excellent good i'm glad that i'm glad you found that useful right so next up then um uh, oh i'm sorry vg says i love the shot as it is if the abbey roof is tall it will look great and um right okay so next up then we're going to it's another this one looking up straight up only this time what we can see is all the leading lines are drawing us to the carving in the middle as well and and from that we, we get a sense of all the other incredible bits of stonework that's building around so here we're looking straight up and whilst there is blue sky the blue sky is framing what we're looking at rather than being the focus of what we're looking at so this one's from Sophie and Sophie says this is my uh, uh, picture for the challenge I took it when traveling in Lisbon was under I was trying the um was trying to look up trying the looking up point oh yes try, sorry was trying the looking up point of view under this beautiful arch so yeah and, and I think this is the point whereby what Sophie managed to do here is combine that style of architectural photography where it's all about the geometry you know uh, so all the leading lines are leading us to this point but also what she's done is she's got a bit like when Jim was talking earlier about having if you've got a strong diagonal it often works really well if you can get that one of that that, that diagonal into the corner rather than just missing the corner you get it directly into the corner of the picture it quite often has a stronger effect and in this case all the diagonal lines go straight out into the corner and that really strengthens and emphasizes um, the geometry and the, the power of this this structure so fun architectural shot nicely done there Sophie uh, so extra smug points for you for that um, right um okay uh Anya says can i ask what do you th whether you think gimp is a good editing program kim and how it compares to photoshop okay well i have to say i have never actually used gimp so it's almost impossible for me to give um well it is impossible for me to, to give a direct comparison i use photoshop because i'm a professional photographer it's industry standard i've been using it for 20 years um, Photoshop isn't necessarily an easy program to just leap into it has to be said but then having said that there are 10,000 million YouTube videos on every aspect of Photoshop you'll ever need to know 
The main thing about Photoshop is it costs money. If you get the basic um, uh, package, you're looking at roughly about £10 a month or €10 Euros a month. Um, so now, certainly as a professional photographer, that's not a problem at all. It's part of the investment. It's part of you know what I'm paying for. Some people don't really like the idea of paying a monthly fee. Um, and at that point, GIMP is free. And as far as I can tell from other hearing other reports, GIMP is very a very, very good free alternative to Photoshop. Like I said, I don't really know. What I would say, though, is use YouTube. YouTube will be full of videos and tutorials on how to make the best out of the, the program. Any free program like that, and especially something like GIMP, is going to have loads of things. Now, I've not looked them up because I don't use it. Um, so it kind of comes down to what you want. I don't know how much more Photoshop does or what things Photoshop does that GIMP can't. Um, so I'm afraid I'm not really the best person to, to ask for that. But uh, try a few forums, do a bit of research on the internet. And like I say, part of it also comes down to, are you happy to fork out an extra 10 euros or 10 pounds uh, ish per month in order to pay for it? Um, will it give you the extra that you need? Um, <clears throat> right, where are we? Okay, so April says beautiful carvings. Karen says stunning detail. Rosemary says such a beautiful roof. The comparison really sets it off well. Madrid says beautiful photo. Sophie, the details and colours are wonderful. Jim says lovely shot. Uh, John says like the art shot in the Lisbon, Sophie. Uh, VG says, oh, um, all right, VG's still chatting with Meg about uh, fear of heights or not. Um, and also, also mentions the fact in 25 days and travelling to... Himachal, uh, Himachal, which is the tallest freezing peaks in India. Um, I'm afraid and excited to visit uh, the trek and photograph. So yeah, well, the, we're really looking forward to seeing what you what you come uh, the photos you create in that. I mean that's just going to be absolutely stunning, VG. Um, uh, Onya says quite expensive, I think, for Photoshop. Well, again, I mean if you're talking about uh, not ten pounds a week, ten pounds a month, I think. It's about 120 pounds a year or 120 euros ish a year. Um, right. Oh, and she goes on to say, I need to learn some more about for, from the tutorials. Uh, or oh, Vinod says it's raining there. Well, well, yeah, okay. So that's so wet in your part of India. Um, April says you can try Photoshop Elements. Um, oh, Vinod saying network issues. Uh, Viji says, uh, thank you, April. And oh, Rebecca's here. It says Elements is a good alternative indeed. Glad you could make it along, Rebecca. Okay, right. Okay, so next one then is we're going to look at is April. And April sent in this one. And I I must admit, I really like this one. And April says, uh, I got my inspiration from your friend Peter's work. This was done on a cloudy day. I would like to try the same spot on a sunny day. And I think, yeah, absolutely. This is what we talked about back at the beginning, which is go there in different weather conditions, different lighting conditions, um, if you found a good spot. And I, I um, so this is uh, just a random building in an area not far from me. I call it the ski slope building. I like the reflections and the diagonal lines. So this is a really good example then of that um, cropping in. Find a bit of the building which has got some interesting lines and essentially you become more abstract with it. So, yeah, I, th I I really like this one. I think you've 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 taken on board what Peter was talking about there, April, and you've kind of created something out of that yourself. So, super smug, extra smug points for you with that. Um, again, yes, if you were to visit this in bright sunshine, the it'd be interesting to see what the reflections were doing. I imagine the color, the the sort of reddish brown color, would become more accentuated as well. But likewise with this, if you're doing this on a dull day, you could just as e equally convert this into black and white. As you'll know from other things, what we've talked about before is there's a whole number of ways you can convert to black and white. And it's maybe worth trying a few of these. If you desaturate, that's one way of doing it. Another way is to use the gradient map. That's perceptual. That's classic. I quite like the classic one. That kind of, um, or like I say, there's the kind of um, hue saturation kind of thing or gradient map kind of deepens the shadows a little bit but you can also play around with if we go to the channels with this the red channel gives you that the green channel gives you that and the blue channel gives you that so you can see each of the channels changes the emphasis of the different tones as well so 
there's a lot to play with with this photo as well. So interesting shapes. Um, again, if you're going back there to photograph again, I would consider you've, you've got this line coming down into this bottom corner. Maybe if there's a way of cropping it or creating it so that you're part of the line of the diagonal goes up into the top left corner as well, I think you might find that that adds a certain strength to the picture. But yes, go back and play. But uh, thanks very much for sending that one in April. Um, Binot says black and white is also looking good. And Jim says this is a super image, uh, but, but he prefers the color version. Yep, that's absolutely, that's fine. Oh, maybe it says lovely photo eight, April. Um, and what else have we got? And oh, and April says thank you. Cool. Okay, so what we'll do is we're just going to come on to one of the last pictures now. Uh, it comes in from Maybrit in Denmark, and um, and then I will tell you about the about what we what we're talking about next week, and just a little introduction as to what I might or might not be doing in two weeks' time because it gets complicated in two weeks' time. So don't rush off too quickly because um, there's news to come. So Maybrit then sent in this photo here and said, I live on the outskirts of Copenhagen. Uh, there are, so there are not so many interesting buildings as there are actually in Copenhagen itself. But I have passed by this house as part of a set of terraced houses several times. I would have been thinking it would be an interesting photo because of the rounded roof and the square window. I took the photo early morning where the sun made just a small shadow on the window, which is an interesting little detail. In Photoshop, I've added the Gaussian blur, which I really, or, uh, which I, I really like blur. So, okay, I like the way you've isolated this. You, um, you've taken the building and kind of abstracted a bit by taking, making the building blur, uh, sorry, the, making the sky blurred in the background. However, we've, we seem to have here an even more exaggerated version of the problem that we had, that cat with Karen, which is something to do with the editing process, has created this kind of fluffy dark area around it. So now, it, rather wonderfully, um, which makes my life a lot easier, May sent me the uh, original unedited image of this. So we can see that the, the kind of after and before. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how to create that effect that you wanted, but without having that fluffy bit here. So uh, let's just um, open that for the moment. And let's just close. So we've got VG. Uh, on your and um, April's photos so we can just play around with this so this is our our main photo and first of all we'll do what we'll do is I will just get rid of the um, there's a little lamp sitting oops, wrong one here go to the, um, the patch tool I'll get rid of that I'll get rid of these trees here because they weren't playing a part of your picture um, and so that creates that and I think what I will also do is there's a little bit of shadow on here, which again, I don't think is necessarily adding anything. So I'll just remove that. So now we've got this, what can we do with it? I will duplicate this layer for a moment. Now, what I think you did before was you cut out this building. So I'll just do a kind of quick selection here, copy that and paste it. So we now have the, the building on its own. Now, what you can do here, is the, the problem that you've got is if we just blur this in the way that um, you did earlier. So we're we'll kind of we're kind of for a big blur, just kind of uh, something like that, and then we paste that on top. We've blurred everything out, but you can see what's happened is the blur of the building has spilled out into the sky. So when we paste the building back on, we still got the blur of the building behind it. That's where that's where the problem lies. So how do we get around this? Now, what you could do, there's two quick ways. Well, one quick way of doing it when we've got an isolated building like this is essentially I will use the patch tool to remove the building. I'm going I'm, by filling all this in. It's going to take the information from everything outside this dark patch, which is now blue and white, and it's going to fill in that space. It's like the kind of content aware fill basically. Um, and then what we do is we can blur this. Now if I go to Gaussian blur like that again same amount of blur now when I stick the thing back on we don't have that blurry line of the building. 
What I would say, though, is if you're going to do this, rather than just a, a standard blur like that, I wouldn't recommend the idea of a movement blur. So if I just um, go back a step here, and instead of a... So if we go to filter, blur, motion blur, see, and instead of a Gaussian blur, you can kind of give it a shape. So now if we, and we can even if we wanted, change the direction of it, we might. So supposing we decide to do something like that, and we... So there's a sense of maybe movement in the sky, like cloud, and then this is going to kind of echoes the idea of like a long exposure. So you see here now when we've got the picture, that I think the movement blur kind of adds this sort of kind of sense. And then within this as well, I will just um, filter creative raw. I'll just, um, I'll just bring up some of the shadows. No, that's, that's highlights, sorry bring up some of the shadows and maybe create a bit of clarity, something like that, maybe expose that a little bit more, maybe even hit the vibrance a little bit, which kind of will intensify the blue in the window there. And now that sits there and stands out against this background. Now, sometimes you don't have the opportunity to um, cut out the whole building without it kind of really so what you can do at that point, I would say, is if you take the clone tool and then what we do is we copy a bit of sky here. So and that needs to be at 100 percent. And then just what we're trying to do is get as much. Because this is going to stretch when it blurs, which what we're really trying to do is take in the edge of the building here so that when we blur it, it's not going to spill over into the main picture. Um, so I'm not taking out the whole lot. You so using the sometimes using the clone tool is an option if you can't actually just remove the whole thing. Um, and now again, if I go to the filter, the blur, the, the motion blur, um, stick that back in. We've we've come in enough. Well, there's a little bit of it starting to come through there. So maybe I would need to have taken a little bit more out on that bit. But mostly we've kind of got away from it. So your options then are from this, you can either um, use your clone tool to try and take out some of the edges, or if you can remove the building completely, do that. And then, like I say, I think a motion blur rather than a Gaussian blur. So instead of ending up with that we end up with that. And I think that makes a sort of slightly more interesting photo. So hopefully then, um, Maybrit, that gives you um, some ideas to play with and answers the problem of, of the, the fluffiness around the edge. Right. So um, where are we? Um, so Karen says she likes that little shadow under the window. Uh, VG likes the edit, um, and April says, uh, oh, April's got to run. <laughs> um, April says, thank you, I hoped you would fix that problem. And Jim says, nice edit tips, thank you. Excellent, great. So, thank you to everyone who sent in the images. I found it really fascinating and interesting, because like I say, I know so little about um, architectural photography that this has been a real journey for me as well so not just from my own things being able to see what how everybody else has been coming at it and then to be able to answer the questions and make me think about okay when is it better to convert to black and white when is it better to work with hard shadows or soft light um, so that's been uh, re and also even things like you know John sending in the picture of the whole building making me realize and think about actually maybe you don't need the whole building maybe what you really need is a detail of these buildings so by answering your questions and looking at these um, it's given me a much greater insight part of the thing I love about doing these podcasts they often say the best way to learn anything is to teach and I have learned so much about photography because of everybody sending me in photos and then me having to work out how to help so thank you to every smug points all around to everybody who sent stuff in smug points to all of you who've actually turned up as well and been giving me the comments and um, and the reassurance as well after the beginning of this uh, the debacle at the, the start of, the, of, of this podcast of trying to get it going. Now, next week, then next week, we are going to talk about fog. And taking photographs in fog and mist. The other thing about next week as well is there will be there's an option there for you to send in your images for critique. So the, I think I'm going to pretty much limit it to around four or so images 
So if you would like your image to, um, if you'd like some kind of critique feedback on images, whether it's architectural, some that you go and take out, or whether it's ones that you've got in your folder, whether it's about something to do with fog, but it's something to do with anything you like. There's no um, particular, uh, there's no specific um, theme for the critique. The critique can be on any photo. If you've got a problem, if you've got a sticking point, if the photo isn't doing quite what you want it to, and you're not sure why, either put it into the Facebook group we've got, we've got a Facebook group called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, or email it to me, kim at kimayres.co.uk. Tell me what your problem is, tell me what your sticking point is, and I will do my best to help. Now, the next, uh, the, the other thing I just want to give you a quick heads up, I will talk, talk much more about this in detail next week, is in two weeks time, which is the first weekend of June, uh, be the 5th of June, um, I'm involved in a thing called Spring Fling. Spring Fling being an open door event for artists and makers in the area. There's going to be about 90 or 95 artists in Dumfries and Galloway, Southwest Scotland, who are opening their doors to the public. Now, I'm not actually operating from my own house. There's another space I'm going to be using, which friends have very kindly lent me. I'm also going to be sharing that space with my wife, Maggie. Um, so if you do happen to be in Southwest Scotland, do come and visit us um, over that weekend. I will give more detail about that next week. But the other thing is, is it does mean I won't be able to do a live podcast in the way that I'm doing it now. What I think I will try doing, though, is throughout that weekend is essentially attempt to do a few live snippets using my phone onto YouTube. If anybody's done this before or wants to give me some tips, please email me or leave me a message in the Facebook group because that will be really useful. It's not something I've done before. I'm going to be a totally new territory. So two weeks time, there won't be a direct podcast, but there could be quite a few little snippets of live from uh, Spring Fling. So thought I'd give you a little bit of heads up about that. OK, so that's us pretty much come to an end. Like I say, if you've enjoyed this, found this interesting, would like to support, buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do that. Uh, right, last few moments. Uh, what have we got? Oh, Robert's turn. Excellent. Glad you made it. Robert uh, says the motion blur makes it look more like a time lapse photo. Nice effect. Excellent. Uh, Jim says nice edit tips. John says brilliant edit. Thank you. Um, ben Odd says uh, I love the love the way of your editing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Rebecca says thanks for the information. Uh, VG says good night everyone. Have a good week. Uh, Anya says thank you so much Kim I learned a lot today glad you did and uh, Jim says you can go live on Facebook this is true I was thinking about maybe doing Facebook or maybe even doing Instagram part of the problem is as I know there's a couple of people here who come to these regularly come to these podcasts who don't do Facebook which is why I always offer the option to email me the images likewise there are people who don't do Instagram so I'm not totally sure maybe I'll have a go at doing all three I'll do a live bit on Facebook a live bit on Instagram a live bit on YouTube I don't know. Still got to figure it out yet. Um, right. So that is us. Uh, thank you to everybody who sent in images. Thank you to everybody who turned up. And um, I hope you all have a good week. I look forward to catching up with you the next week when we do the fog. Uh, I'll talk about photographing fog and mist. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.